time for putting all this gibberish. There's nothing but rubbish. We don't have that. We simply don't have enough skilled people in this country to, to be able to be productive players in our economy. Whether it's in service sector or manufacturing or in IT or teaching or any sector, we simply don't have enough people. There is a severe shortage of people in this country. And that's what we should focus on. If we have a thousand people competing and we can have a luxury picking up two people, then I can say how better test it. That's not. We don't have it. that is causing the dropout rate after 10th also. I mean, there's a huge dropout rate in school and due to, due to many reasons. I mean, how can this be addressed uh, that the education, learning is important. I mean, people just come, students just come for middays and then go back. Your target is to eat and go. That's it. I mean, uh, even the parents are sending them only because they're not, uh, I mean, the root cause could be poverty or anything else. Root causes are different, but the importance of education is not I mean, is not addressed anywhere. So, are there any mechanisms or uh, any tips you could give us, or at least modeling to few children on learning the importance of education or mentoring parents or what whatever it could be? Any few tips on that? What you actually mentioned is a heart rending problem. Take Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is the first state that started off with this maintaining program. When we started some years later, the two rupees secular rise, Tamil Nadu started with the under India maintainers. In many ways, the trajectory of Tamil Nadu is shaped by that one single decision. What happened is, maintainers were taken so seriously by the government there, like our two rupees secular rise at that time, it became the political center. Because the scheme had to be well implemented in order to get the vote, the government focused all its political and administrative attention on this scheme. And because people's attention focused on the schools in the form of midday meals, naturally there is a spillover to education. Some accountability came in. And Tamil Nadu tried to deliver better education than IP. Always Tamil Nadu is better in the social service sector and then the delivery of social services. And therefore the female literacy went up. Population came under control faster than GDP. Skill level went up as people got a few years of good schooling. And because of that, automobile sector started coming in. Now it became the automobile hub of India. Urbanization went up dramatically. What's happening in AP is the education is such a fallingly poor quality. The political attention is so totally diffused on schools. Even after the children are attracted by the retaining program, they simply are not outcomes. Parents are not fools. After three, four years, they realize the child is simply winding away her time, maybe having some free food there, but is not really getting anything of value. It's not that they don't want education. Don't confuse that. They know when they see a child that the child is getting good education or not. When they understand the child is not getting anything of value, then they will have to drop out of school because anyway, no fight. The problem is the other way around. Not because they don't care for education. Because they have despaired of getting good education. It is a severe indictment of public schools in this state. Because in this state, only the poorest of the poor, not even the poor, the poorest of the poor send their children to public schools. Even the poor, with some kind of a regular income, they prefer to send their children to some ranch like this private school hoping that they get accountability. So really, how do you ensure that there are outcomes during those three, four years when they are still there, during the midday meal phase, so that at least some of the children stay back because they, they have understood the value of learning, children themselves. And children after four, five years, some of them do understand the value of learning. They have little senses that they should study. And the parents also, they get the fright that my child is getting nothing out of it. Right now they get nothing out of it. It's a supply chain problem. And we have to do a lot. It's not the parents. And earlier, I used to think that we have somehow persuade these parents, you must send your children to school, persuade the poor people don't have too many children. All these are not true. We haven't created an ambience where the behavior is reshaped. That's all. And for our failure, we're blaming them. It's entirely the government's failure, the society's failure. One last question. Yes, sir. education. But uh, the kindergarten uh, education and the primary uh, years of education, 
there is that emphasis is not uh, paid on that. And the teachers are of the kindergarten schools as levels. They have never paid that amount of uh, salary. As well as the qualification level is also there for them. So don't you think the initial years of a person's education should be the most uh, crucial years? And how can we change that? So that the learning starts from the very uh, start of the education. And how do we improve the level of that for schools? I think even we don't understand what really is education at the pre-primary and the early primary levels. And until you raise a child, you don't understand how tough it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we all commit mistakes. And after that, we all become very tough. However, why do you all again commit mistakes? Because the answers are specific to a particular child. When there is some generic uh, model, I don't think there is one universal answer to educate a child. But yet, the society has to find some kind of generic models. We can't find a specific model for each child. And in our society, we are particularly directed because we don't really understand child psychology. Our idea of teaching is, I slay it and then start with alphabet and then we do it, damn it, kind of thing. <laughs> Somehow they learn and I don't know how they do it. And then get a multiplication table. <laughs> Somehow it's working, I don't know. When I look back, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. But clearly, in our country, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't really paid attention to the teaching in early years of schooling. And our so-called uh, teacher-telling institutes for that are simply, as I mentioned already, uh, they are make-believe. They are of no consequence. And I think a lot of work needs to be done. Because I don't have any answers myself. I am not doing it with any, with any great depth. But I know how to address the challenge of mathematics or physics or biology or something else at higher education <laughs> or higher secondary education. I really don't know what to do myself in primary education. I am sure it takes a lot of patience. Uh, and we require a lot of expertise. And the best technology we don't have that expertise. The Montessori system is the only one that made a serious effort in this country, though borrowed from other countries. But in Montessori, after some years, we are terrified. After three, four years, now, oh my God, Montessori doesn't test the kids and all that, and get on and the kids be suitable for other institutions. There's always this fear. Otherwise, some institutions are doing a good job, but they are still exceptional institutions. There is no pattern today available which can be universally applied to our satisfaction and we have to focus on that ideology. If you permit me, I'll take the other questions together. No, I don't want to disappoint them. Uh -huh. Like teaching through English versus teaching through the particular language. So, such a thing was already uh, experimented in uh, West Bengal for about 10 years. But the previous reform government, they withdrew the teaching of English in uh, public schools. And for almost 10 years, uh, they were taught in the local vernacular language and eventually it was found that the kids are not learning the English and eventually they are becoming, uh, they are forced to become cadres of the political party. So, and so eventually it was uh, like uh, repealed. So, what what would you suggest uh, in that scenario? Why was that, why did that experiment fail? I will take the question. Not the soul side of it together. I don't want to. We have a passion of working at Inclusive, whereas in the teachers at the ground, they were, uh, I mean, I will not say they don't have passionate, they are not passionate, but I will say that can we have a class like Indian Education Services, like we do have our administrative services, civil services, wherein we can bridge that gap of socio-economic status, wherein a teacher or a person who has passion for teaching and passion to see a society change can stand and say proudly that I am a teacher working at so and so position in so and so institution. Like we have thousands of uh, students working for civil services preparing, wherein we have thousands of students preparing for becoming a good teacher. So can we have that status in India, that Indian education services? Thank you. So, I have been to a government school. I have seen uh, people not in place, infrastructure wise, teachers, and all that. So, uh, we as a group started helping them on in infrastructure work. But uh, am I supposed to be a whistleblower or help them as I did? I just put a suggestion. Actually, I come from a village background of this 100 families where there was a school uh, which can be set a school by seeing the blackboard in this 70 pages. People use it to go, now, now also it happens like people go to the nearest town for education. 
small kids. So you know, he was speaking of something like adopting schools that we are thinking actually we run an organization separately to fund uh, meritorious students. So we are thinking like uh, your idea actually we got it earlier also. So uh, in what way we can adopt schools? Like you said one of the things was uh, uh, train teachers in some way. So any other spheres that you can suggest, any other pointers in a way that we can adopt schools like in uh, children's perspective. Now, the government has already a lot of taxi debts to the uh, uh, companies and some other companies. And it's very a way into the towns and all that, that the education system. But whereas here, because of this cooking and all that real estate boom, uh, even for a small school also, they have stopped it. It is a lot of effort and so cost of education is become very high. So if we get that uh, kind of uh, SDGs system in education also, so that even the normal people can try to get good uh, education to their kids. Good evening, sir. Till now we are discussing about poor and rich like that. What, what is your opinion with respect to uh, reservation based on tax and <laughs> <laughs> because in engineering and all the things, there will be some uh, reservations and all that. Uh, one more question. Like if you look today uh, in Andhra Pradesh, there are 3,000 schools which doesn't have a single teacher. So how long a voluntary NGO can take up a school? So this is not a job of an NGO, frankly speaking. So the government has to step in. Today if you look in Andhra Pradesh, right now two implemented policies of are you dominating the uh, plus two section? That is Sri and Narayana. So the other, other, other players are getting, uh, they are not, they are not in the picture. If you look, the same thing will happen in the schools. So how can we protect the government schools which doesn't have a single teacher? And there are schools which doesn't have even students. How can we bring them back? Because in a system like UK, everything is free and the government schools are, uh, they are the main primary source for the poor or the rich. But India, as you say, like, the government schools are meant for poor and the poor. Even I don't, I, I don't turn my kid to a government school. So how can we bring back the, uh, the state that I gave back so what was there previously for the government schools? Because I don't think that NGOs has to do something in this area. Let me start with this last question. Please. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether we can apply what we use in telecom and in uh, rural banking perhaps to education as well, where uh, you know corporate uh, educational institutions like maybe Delhi Public School or whatever, when they are allowed to operate in urban areas, they also have to perform certain services in rural areas. I don't know how easy it is, but I'm wondering if that model can work. Let me take that question about. Uh, government versus NGOs, I tell you this, ultimately providing decent education at school level is squarely the responsibility of the state. They cannot be a substitute to the state. The NGOs can be facilitators, they cannot really be service providers, unless the state is actually the funder, in which case others can take over the role of performing the duty, there's no problem with that. But I don't see them stepping into the government's role. Take this Chaitanya Narayana issue. The daughter I'm talking about is now finished 10. So now I have this problem. <laughs> I want you to understand now, at a conceptual level, it's easy to comprehend, but as we go into specific minute detail, there is a huge question. Now, this girl, despite my advice, wants to do medicine. It's her right after all. She wants to do medicine. I told her, look, medicine is a little more competitive to get into. If you would like to choose something, Easier as an option, I don't mind. That's all nice fair, but she said no. I said fine. If you want to get into medicine, you have to get a competitive examination. And she started going to one of these schools I over on the GPs. The teaching is appalled. Appalled. She went to an excellent school so far, and compared to that, no teacher is anywhere near those school teachers. And supposedly, the best of these children and Narayana types, you know, the Premier League, blah, blah, whatever they call them. But if she doesn't go to these schools, the problem is, the weekly tests which prepare her for competition, which make them regularly, you know, go through the whole thing, be regular in attendance as well as uh, studies, 
that you can master the detail as well as the concept. That incentive is not there. You may be right. In a highly competitive environment, that your right is not enough. Because your tests are very boring and tough. They are not testing the brilliance of the candidate and the capacity to apply knowledge. They are actually testing the detailed knowledge as well as some application of knowledge. And therefore, between somebody who has practiced regularly and methodically and somebody else who has done it um, in the last phase of um, uh, the course before examination is well informed but has not practiced adequately, there's always a gap. And it's a very cruel dilemma. I really don't want my child to go through this. But if she wants to flourish, I don't see any other option at this point of time. So why is it happening? To a third rate institution with third rate teachers and compared to send because there are no first rate institutions with first rate teachers. It's a supply side problem. Even when they are paid, and these teachers have a resume are paid pretty substantial because there's such intense competition, they are paid very well. 70, 80,000 rupees, 100,000 rupees per month for these, for these teachers, they are not bad wages. And even then, they are not getting the best. So it's a supply side problem essentially. This, in a substantial measure, the problem of all education in this country is a huge supply side problem. Urban versus uh, rural, uh, this kind of uh, telephony, etc., could be could we find a measure, method of transferring resources from urban to rural by any which I believe there is. I believe we should look at that. I, I can't really answer uh, with any detailed uh, scheme right now. But I think if you go to many of these well-meaning educational institutions and say, look, we want you to transfer some of your knowledge to rural kids, and let's together design a way of doing it. But if you do it by law, by compulsion, it will become very routine, dreary. But if you actually have a partnership and have an innovative mechanism by which some such institutional capabilities are transferred, I think they will be more than willing, many of them, not all, and that will do us a great deal of good. But that means the people who design it must be innovative themselves and they are passionate themselves. And that's going to be a great challenge. Who is there in government? There was a time when I offered to my chief secretary, I finished two districts at that time, I was lioness as a collector and so on and so forth. They said, what's the posting you would like to have? I was one of those privileged ones and they told me whatever I wanted to pick up, I could pick up. I said, look, give me a role in shaping education in a few districts. Make me the czar of education for these, whatever area you feel I should take charge. Give me three or four districts. Don't bother me for the next three years or five years. Just ignore me. Trust me. I suppose there's enough basis to trust me on the basis of the past track record. Give me whatever resources are reasonable, and I will figure out a way. I'll come back to you with outcomes. They said, no, we cannot do that. I offered myself. It's actually infrared in India, unfortunately, for a senior IA subject to say, I will take charge of education in a few districts, school education in a few districts as the sole responsibility. They said, no. I actually wanted to do it. To me, it is great fun. Provided there is complete autonomy there. Provided I can break through the thicket of these rules and regulations and this foolishness. And I can punish and reward as I believe is necessary given the circumstances. And ultimately, unless you carry the community with you and the teachers with you, you cannot survive. So they must trust my capability in carrying the community and the teachers. But if they sit over my head every second and the second gets me, then there's no way you can deliver. In a large bureaucracy, education in a large bureaucracy, they have tremendous collective bargaining power. About 400,000 or 900,000 employees of the state are school teachers. They were numbers wise, they're not available really for the government. So unless you take them into confidence, inspire them, even as on occasion you wrap them in the nakhil, unless you inspire them, merely punishment will not help. The numbers are too big. And in any case, these are the only ones we have. You don't have some other 400,000 pillars available overnight to come and teach. You have to inspire them. You have to make them better. You have to make them feel that what they're doing is incredibly important, which it is. But there's no political way. And that continues to be the case even today. That's why this whole right to education act is a sham act. Intention may be sound, but there is absolutely no soul in that. There is no heart in that. At best, it provides a, a bit more money, but in a very structured, in a very, in a, in a very bureaucratic way. You know, so that, at best, a starting point. Language. Now, I want you.
to be clear about one thing. I am not opposed to teaching English from grade one or whatever as a language. We are talking mainly of using that language as a medium of instruction. And my argument is not cultural at all. My argument is academic. And I am prepared to be tested on this assertion anywhere in the world. The empirical evidence globally is a child that is taught in a language in which he communicates with her peers and family, habitually as a child. Prospers well if she is taught in that language at school for the first few years. Now if the child is taught, is, 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 speaks in English habitually with the family, I have no problem. But for 99.5% of children in this country, that is not true. Therefore, it is not against English or uh, some other language. It is not out of chauvinism. It doesn't matter which language it is. English may be taught as a language, but not in that language. You cannot have the instruction in that language simply because the child does not understand. So because we are all comfortable with English, we are saying this. Let's think of a situation. Tomorrow, some chief minister comes and says, let there be Arabic medium of instruction for every child, for all children. For some reason, Arabic is a very prestigious, respected language. And that's the consequences. See how horrendous it is. That's what it is for most children in English. English is no different from Arabic. Please understand. We are getting confused because we are comfortable with English. We are corrupted by that. So it's not a, uh, a linguistic challenge. No. As I told you, I think in English. When I speak in Telugu, I translate every second into that. I stop thinking in Telugu long back. So it's not about your love of language. It's about your love of learning, damn it. Let the child have a chance to learn. And you see these products, 95% of these products in school, they don't either English nor Telugu. They taught in English in schools. They don't know English. They can't speak one sentence in English. I guarantee you. They cannot write one passage in English on their own. They're useless. So let's not drink ourselves. What Bengal has done is something stupid. It is linguistic chauvinism. It is cultural superiority. It is a needless phobia against English. These are important. And I'm saying progressively bring them into English as a medium of instruction. After three, four years, progressively bring them into English as a medium of instruction, but then they come to higher education. But even if that is to be done, I challenge you, where are the teachers? Where are the teachers who can teach in Telugu to start with? You certainly don't have teachers who can teach in English. You don't have them. Even in very good schools, it's a huge task to find a good teacher who can teach in English. One of my daughter's concerns is, apart from the content of education, and she went to this one of these Narayana Chipanga types, she says, Dad, you can't use the English. Her teachers can't use the English. She is way about them. They are her teachers. But coach have to them. That's all they are. So we don't have them. So the problem is much more complicated. We take immediately positions about this. I could see they were asked because of Bengal experience. But the problem is more complicated. Even if you want English medium schools in this country, you don't have teachers who can teach in English in this country. Not even 5% of them. It's not a 50% of them. It's a 95% problem. There's no choice. We must be practical about it. And no country is at this problem in India. We are the only ones who think that you can teach anybody in English from day one and then you can get the child. It's absurd. I'm absolutely certain about it. It's absurd. Teachers, passion, socioeconomic status, therefore can an Indian education service be an answer? No. By definition, an elite service is a big elite one. A verified one, a small number of people, highly empowered, very visible, have a sense of self-esteem, a lot of peer pressure. We can't do that for 400,000 people. Again, the problem is, where are these people? We don't have them. What we can do is obviously increase the salaries and wages even better, even more. Attract a few more better people. You would use things that certainly not attract the best in the country. Nowhere in the world are the best in the country attracted to education, school education. Let's be practical. They are attracted to Ivy League education, but not the school education. But you can attract a few more if you give better salaries and give more respect. But more important than salaries is create an ambience where there is self-esteem. 
Our teachers were paid 70 rupees a month when he was four years in the primary school. Oftentimes they were paid once in six months. But they were very, very important people in the village. They were highly respected in the village. Today the teacher is treated like, I don't want to use dirty words. There's no self-respect at all. There's contempt. And yet some teachers are doing an outstanding job in a place called Babagula in my constituency. The teachers are doing